did I write that? That's actually a pretty cool description of what I do. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so hello everybody, you already know who I am, so we can get started right away. Um, so I'll tell you something about Dev Assistant, which is a thing that I've been working on lately. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, just feel free to, you know, shout them. Well, you don't have to shout, but like feel free to ask, you know, raise your hands and stuff. Uh, if you don't like the presentation, please don't throw stuff at me because I will run away and, you know, it, it would get ugly, like really. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so what is Dev Assistant? Well, uh, when we start with the motivation for Dev Assistant, it is like, uh, that once upon a time, you know, I just sat down and thought and said like, okay, we are developers and we make life easier for people. We make life easier for sysadmins, for norm normal users. But you know what? We actually don't spend that many time to make our own life easier, right? Like, for example, automating the stuff that we need to do, like dependency installation, you know, environment setup for development, you know, kickstarting projects, setting up source code, you know, some scaffolding, stuff like that. So I thought, well, maybe we could do better. Maybe we could just fix this. And so that's how I got the idea of Dev Assistant, which is basically a tool that's meant to uh, help developers with their everyday tasks. That's like what I mentioned, dependency installation, uh, setting up environments, scaffolding source code, working with, uh, you know, repositories and stuff like that. So, yeah, the motto is like automate as much as you can because, you know, the things that can be automated, we should automate because we want to spend all of our working time on doing the real development and not, you know, okay, do I have to install this dependency or that dependency and do I, you know, have to spend like 15 minutes when I'm starting a new project and I always have to create these three files that have like mostly the same content and something like that. Uh, so uh, I think that the target audience of Dev Assistant is basically all developers, but uh, there are some, some specific groups that I'd like to point out. Uh, for example, big, beginners, beginning developers. Uh, these are the people that are like, you know, they're maybe studying high school or university and they want to get started, you know, doing some projects and maybe they don't know, like maybe they just learn how to code in Python and they want to start a new application, but they don't know how to, how to do that. You know, how do I start a new application? How, wh what does the application look like? What libraries should I use? Uh, how do I install dependencies on this given Linux distribution and stuff? So this, this is not really obvious for them. So maybe we can provide them, you know, with a way to, uh, to, to just, you know, set up the environment for them and they can start ha hacking right away. And then, you know, over time, they will learn about it. Uh, and another, another like group or target, target audience is developers switching platforms. Like usually these can be from beginners to, you know, very good coders, but they may not know uh, how the, you know, dependencies get installed. Uh, if you're like transferring from Ubuntu to Fedora, hopefully, uh, then uh, you have like different init system, you have upstart and systemd, and this can get really confusing. So if you, if you want to set that up for your development, you can, it, can take, it can take you like a serious amount of time. Okay, and is this slide puzzling for you? Yeah. Uh, so usually when I talk about Dev Assistant, it's kind of hard to explain how much it can really do for you. So that's why I use this example that I call the story of Joe. And so let me introduce you to Joe. Uh, Joe is an old school Python developer. He doesn't like Python 3. Uh, he's always just coded, you know, like the low level system stuff. And just recently he said, well, okay, maybe I wanna try to create, you know, a cool web application 
let's say I'll try out Django. And hey, I also heard about the Docker stuff. That's pretty cool, right? So I want to try that. But I really don't know how to you know, approach that. I've never done that. And yeah, so someone told Joe about Devil System. So, you know, he got Devil System, he installed it. He actually installed the latest uh, Git checkout, which is not advisable for normal users, but you know, Joe is an old school hacker, so he's okay with that. Um, so Joe discovers Deva system, and he wants to create a new project in Django. So Deva system has two like main binaries. We have Deva system, and if you run Deva system, it tells you that it is okay to run Deva system, but you could probably use just DA, which is like a shortcut. So Joe heard that, so he just runs DA right away. So it shows him some stuff. And he just skims through that and sees, okay, CRT is used for creating new project. All right. So I'll just run this. Wow, oh, that's a lot of stuff. Uh, so just skimming through that. Okay, I see Python. That's close enough. Okay. I see Django getting closer now. Okay, so this looks like an endpoint then that we could actually use. So let's read the help, let's reread about all the options that are here and let's see what we will use. So we have help, okay, we don't need that. We have GitHub. Come on, I'm an old school coder. Do I need GitHub? No, I don't. Uh, virtual env. Well, Joe has actually used Python's virtual env and it's, he thinks it's pretty cool, so he'll start with passing virtual env argument to Deva system. Okay, then name of the project, obviously, and we'll name the project Kujo. Uh, then we can use Docker add docker file and create docker io image. Well, that sounds pretty cool too. Uh, Python 3, no, please, no, thank you. Uh, Eclipse, Vim, oh, I have my own uh, like, you know, editor set up, so I don't, I don't want anything more. Let's just run that. Okay, so he runs that and he prays that it works because otherwise my presentation is pretty much screwed. Um, Okay, so now it's doing stuff, and uh, do you know some good jokes or something? Like, I, th I heard a good joke recently, you know. Like, do you know why six is afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine. Uh, does anyone know any more jokes? The, what's the difference between zero and eight? Well, I don't know. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I, I'll, I'll need to write that down after the presentation. Please come here. Uh, okay, so if we look at what Dev Assistant is outputting, we can see that it's, for example, right here, it's building the Docker image. Okay, and now it failed and I'm screwed. Um, <laughs> well, this actually, this actually, Joe will report this to us in upstream, and we will we will tell him that it that this is a failure in the uh, Docker Pi library, which sometimes does this timeout and we will report it to them and they will get it fixed. But hopefully the project is set up. Let's pray for that, please. Okay, Let, let's, let's try to look at it. Okay, so we have something that looks remotely similar to Python's virtual env. We have, sorry, I'll just clean it up and do it again. Uh, we have the bin directory, the Kujo, which is the directory with the project and like, all the stuff that belongs to Python's virtual env. So, okay, let's 
try to do this. Okay, so it seems that maybe we have done it, so let's hope. Um, and we can go on. So we have hopefully created a project, hopefully it didn't fail and everything is fine again. But just let's pretend we did an attack. Um, so uh, now Joe wants to develop. And if you're developing using Docker, then uh, like the, the best workflow, or I think the best workflow is that you actually fire up the container, you open up uh, the port that it needs to open, and you actually mount the source code from your system into the container. So that when you change the source code on your system, uh, it also changes the code in the container and you can like open up Firefox or Chromium or whatever you're using and you can in real time have the container running so your application is running in the environment that it will always be running in the Docker image. And you can see it like live, which is pretty cool. So. Let me just list, if it didn't fail, it would all, uh, if the previous command didn't fail, it would provide me like with a command line, like this one that you, see, you can see over here, that I would just run straight away, straight away. But right now I'll just, I'll just guess that I need to use this image and I will run Um, that it didn't work that well, so uh, we can use uh, we can use uh, this command without the dash e command to uh, without the dash e option to actually reconstruct the image. So let's try it once more and hope that it will work this time. You know, and that the extension library won't fail. And uh, any more good jokes? What you call what? Uh -huh. What you call? Oh, what you call zero with no i? Well, I have no idea. Okay, it's timed out again. Um, but it's really not a bug on in Dev Assistant. You know, it's is in the extension library, and I'm terribly sorry. And please don't tell anyone. Please, please don't tell my bosses because otherwise I'm not getting bonuses. <laughs> uh, so let's pretend that we have been able to run the container and it was running successfully and everything was you know, great and happy and stuff. And Joe discovers that his project is actually pretty cool and he may want to you know, put it on GitHub maybe. He didn't like that in the start, but well, like it's pretty cool and I want to build a community and something. And I don't really like, you know, like pushing buttons in web browser and stuff to create a GitHub repo. So I think I'll try using Dev Assistant for that. And so I just, you know, the, the, the command is written here, but if, if, if we didn't know, we would use the process that we used the first time, like, you know, run DA with dash H or double dash help and see where we want to go from there and then you know just incrementally run help on everything and then when we get to the endpoint we can just run the endpoint so i'm just going to skip that <laughs> and hopefully this time this will work so now i want to create a github repo and push my source code there <laughs> okay I, I i know what's happening um i'm not connected to network my network connection failed. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I'll just, maybe I'll try refreshing this. So please work. It's doing something. Uh, maybe uh, we, could, we could get back to that. Um, So yeah, well, it created the repo under my name, but you can see that 
uh, like the, fir the initial commit is seven minutes ago, so I'm not trying to, you know, to cheat. It's really, does like by this command only, I created the GitHub repo and pushed all the sources uh, there. So that's like, you know, when you're doing it in web browser, it can take like, you know, a couple clicks, maybe a minute or so. And you can just type a command and go get it off easy. Pretty cool. All right. Uh, so now we're at a point where the cool job project is actually gaining a community, you know, and uh, so people want to get the project, people want to start working on it, and you know, when you're getting community, sometimes it's, it's pretty hard to, to like uh, document all the process that they have to undergo to set up your project. Okay, so when you need to set up Kujo, you, you need these dependencies and you need this and that and the Docker image and stuff. And you know, sometimes it just scares the potential contributors off. And so this is uh, like this command that is written in, well, not this bit. Uh, the command that is written at the slide uh, shows how this basically says that you need to check out the source code from that GitHub repo. Actually, and actually before checking it out, you need to create a GitHub fork. So Deva system creates a GitHub fork, checks the repository to your system and installs some same set of dependencies for that. And then the users can rerun as Joe did. They can rerun DA mod Docker develop. We can try that again, maybe. So hopefully it will work this time. And so, so, so the contributors can do this and then they just push to their GitHub fork and then create a pull request. So again, this saves some time and it's, it's like lowering the barrier for people to become part of the community of your project, which is, uh, I think, like there are many complicated open source projects that are fighting with this. Like they, they scare contributors right away because it's just too complicated to get started. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try do it, doing this again. Uh, I don't know, it's, I don't know why, why it doesn't work really. It worked yesterday. How much time have we got? 20 minutes, so I, I have like 20 tries left, so. Anyway. Okay, let's, let's just leave it there and continue with the presentation. So this demonstrates what the system is supposed, well, well it's, it, it should have demonstrated what the assistant is supposed to do, but it actually demonstrates that it is just, you know, the, the Docker implementation is just experimental stuff. You know, it's only in upstream so far, so we haven't got all the bugs and stuff. Yeah, you've seen that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, so how it works. Uh, so the assistant itself is a core that is written in Python and it has these plugins that we call assistants and we have a uh, special DSL for these plugins. Uh, they're basically written in YAML, which is, well, it is, YAML ain't a markup language, you know, but it is actually a markup language, so yeah, anyway. Uh, and we have command line interface and GUI uh, that use API of the core and so they provide the functionality of the assistants to the end user. Uh, if we have a time at the end of presentation, which I think we will, I will sh also show you the GUI. Uh, so this is a simple assistant. Can you read that? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, I call this the insane slide. Uh, it's insane because it looks terrible on the first look, but like if you if you start skimming through it, it's it it should be pretty intuitive what what it does, right? 
it's so so it's on a system. It has a full name. It has some sort of description that you can show to user. Uh, on line five, it specifies its arguments. Like these are the arguments that it takes on the command line, or it will you know generate some sort of input for them in GUI. Uh, so it's its name, which has some flags. These will be used on command line. It has some help, you know, that you want to display to user. Uh, it has some dependencies. Uh, there's a small typo. Uh, there shouldn't be like, there are two more spaces here. It shouldn't be on the same level with, with the RPM dependencies. So the dependencies are maybe the least intuitive uh, part of an assistant. And so a as you see, uh, we have we have RPM and Pacman here. RPM is like Fedora, RHEL, open source stuff. And Pacman is, uh, is Arch Linux stuff. And uh, so each assistant can like specify dependencies for multiple systems. So this, this specific assistant specifies dependencies for RPM based system, like for example, Fedora, let's say, and for Arch Linux. And it works in a way that if you run this on Fedora, Deva system will just install the RPM dependency, which is like say language dash interpreter, and it will skip the Pacman dependency. It just it will just skip it. It won't do anything about it. And if you run this on Arch Linux, it will skip the RPM dependency and install the Pacman dependency, which is probably named differently, right? Because it's different system, different packages, different everything. So this is this is the mechanism of installing dependencies. And then there is the run section, which should be like pretty obvious what it does, because if it's not obvious, you have failed miserably. Is it obvious? Semi-obvious, so we have sort of failed. <laughs> no, uh, it, it, yeah, it, 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 it takes some looking into. What it does is that it, it basically has a simple condition. <laughs> so it looks if the thing that was input by a user as the argument name. <laughs> if it just looks like runs a subshell and looks if this thing exists like a file or directory. If it exists, it, it logs an error and says that it already exists and that it doesn't know what to do because it doesn't want to break anything. So it rather exists. Like, like, uh, so that, that's like the function of error logging. Once you log error in an assistant, it shuts whole Deva system down and returns the non-zero bash version code. And then there's a series of command line invocations, again subshell, like make dir, uh, change your dir into that, and run the, you know, some sort of made up language tool that can start the new project and then possibly we could do something, you know, provide some uh, basic settings, you know, some defaults, something that the developer could get started with right away. And then we just log at info level that the new project has been started successfully and everything is fine. Yes, please. So the question was whether you could write the script in your own file or whether you need to put it in the YAML configuration file. Uh, the answer to that is that, like basically, you can w what you can do is you can write uh, you can write a script that does everything, like a Bash script or Python script or something, and then you can do th then you can just use a run section and just put one CL invocation that will invoke the script, and that's it, right? But I think uh, why we decided to do this is, uh, why we decided to do the DSL is that initially when we started developing the assistant, we wanted to write these assistants in Python, but that was uh, like an uncrossable line for people from some other languages. 
I won't name Ruby and Node.js. And uh, so, you know, we, we, we wanted to provide something that would be like language agnostic. And also it has some, some more advantages. Like for example, we have central logging that goes either to the command line or to the GUI. And also similarly to this, like for example, the registration of repo on GitHub or creating Git, uh, repo on GitHub, it just says dash and instead of logs underscore i, you have GitHub, then you have colon, and then you have something like create repo. So we actually provide the functionality that needs some sort of backend in Python, let's say. And we're providing it to the people who are writing the YAML file. So when you want to write your own assistant, you just, and, and you want the assistant to create a project that actually creates, a, and, and actually create a GitHub repo, you just, you know, put uh, GitHub colon create repo into the YAML file and it works. And these are like, we, we call them commands and they, they work uh, like a callbacks in, into Python. So you can go back and forth to, to Python and then back to YAML. Does it make sense? Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so the question was, uh, how can you install uh, like dependencies, for example, via PyPy or let's say Gems and Ruby Gems and something like that. So, in the dependency section, we have actually two types of dependencies. Uh, the dependencies used in this assistant are system dependencies like RPM and Pacman, but there are also non-system dependencies. These are the language-specific uh, packaging systems or you know, ecosystems like PyPy, RubyGems, uh, NPM, that's for Node.js and uh, CPAN or maybe more. And so, uh, as I said, uh, the system dependencies are skipped on systems where they don't make sense. So Pacman is skipped on RPM-based systems. But then you have these non-system dependencies like PyPy or RubyGems, and these are actually used on all systems. Right, so, and, and we have uh, currently, I think we can do packages from PyPy, we can do RubyGems, and we can do uh, the Node.js packages. And I, it, it, it works in completely the same way, I just don't remember right now the, the shortcut for PyPy dependencies. And just, I, I don't remember it right now, but it's written somewhere in, in our documentation, so you can find it out and you can use that. 